Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our next session, Transparent Web Platform Decoupling with Multiplying Architecture. My name is Amber, and it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today's session, Edder and Guillerme. A few logistics before we get started. If you have questions during the session, please submit them in the chat window, and we will try to cover them at the end of the session. Or we will make it a point to follow up with you after the event to address your question. A recording of this and all the sessions today will be available after the event on the Red Hat Developer YouTube channel. We also encourage you to join us for live chat during the break on the main stage for live dialogue with Red Hatters. And with that, let me turn things over to Edder and Ray. Good morning, everyone. Uh, are you sharing your screen already, Caponeto? Yeah, let me do that. Mm -hmm. Just a second. Can you see my screen? I think so. Yes, I do. I hope others also can 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 see your screen. So good morning, everyone. My name is Eder Ignatovich. I work for Red Hat for a long time, and I'm a tooling architect for the two, for, for the key group. And I'm here with my friend Guilherme. Guilherme is the tech lead for all the infrastructure and foundation. We call that foundation team in our group. So Caponeto is the one that, uh, together with his, with his team, build most of the stuff that we are talking about here. And on the next slide, I will go a little over about what is Key. Key is an open source organization. Uh, there is an umbrella of multiple projects related with, with technology and, and business intelligence. So we have a bunch of open source uh, popular projects, including Druze, JBPM, Cogito, Opta Planner. And nowadays, Caponeta and myself, we are working in a Cogito version for service workflow and service orchestration. And in the next slide, you see what we are building. We are basically building all the tooling uh, uh, related to you write uh, with a nice YAML editor with a lot of stuff, a lot of augmentation that you can fetch open APIs to allow to you draw and orchestrate all your functions, your Knative functions, and run those in an overhead Knative OpenShift environment. But before that, uh, like we spent, I, I'm 10 years at Red Hat, I was joined to build a project called RHMPAM, that is in communities called Business Central is a huge business application that is a, a monolith that is composed of almost 2 million lines of Java code and front-end code. So it's a huge, with a big team that we spend a lot of time. And the, this application was a big monolith. And we are really proud uh, of this, this, all this infrastructure and everything that you build. But under uh, two slides after, uh, uh, please, uh, on the... Uh, two years ago, on the next slide, two years ago, we started the Cogito. Uh, the Cogito was uh, at Red Hat. We decided to revisit all the business automation platform that we had, that instead of having a single monolith where you can alter and deploy everything, you can do a, a microservice. So everything that you become a microservice. And during these initiatives, they give us a chance to, to also to revisit how we build tooling. Because in the past, uh, we started with a, a few engineers. I think I was the fourth of them. And at this stage, 10 years later, we are a, three, a, a team of almost uh, 30 front-end uh, engineers. And this team will become really huge. So we decided to go a step back and understand how to build a better platform. On the next slide is that when we started to do the beginning of this analysis, so basically, we start to decide what is the most important thing in our platform. What are the core comps that we want to reuse to the, choose the new infrastructure? Because one thing that is really important for me is don't throw away stuff. Because to build a graphical editor uh, and that we have a drag and drop and support and have a huge specification is a multi-month, multi-year uh, uh, effort. So I want to reuse it, everything. So we start to do uh, some questions. And the first question that we decided in our team is, on the next slide, is how we adapt uh, our 10 years legacy to a new platform? Like how, how we can adapt to make this um, uh, big monolith that we built to become modern? And the next question is, we are building from that team that started with a handful of engineers to a full stack uh, big group and how we are going to adapt and, and, and this, and the, in, the, uh, in the next slide, please, Caponeto. 
in the next place. And the third question is how I take my big front end, a monolith that is a huge with millions of lines of code and break it in a smaller piece. So we have three questions. The first, how do you don't, you don't throw, throw up stuff and how we can make a big team productive and how we break up that monolith in a smaller pieces. And in the next slide, we see the answer for that was to adopt micro front end uh, architecture. That, that is, 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 is a, yeah, is a uh, architectural paradigm to build modern front ends. And what is micro front end? I will give in a five minute introduction just to have context for what company to show that micro front end is architectural style where you can deliver independent front end applications that are composed in a big application. So you take the concept of a microservices in the back end and bring it to browser. So instead of having a huge monolith or your app, you break out, break down your apps in multiple smaller ones. And in, in, in the final application, you tie everything together in a single unit. And on the next slide is the benefits. No, one, one slide back, sorry, company. Is, is the benefits of micro front end technology. You can have incremental upgrades because each smaller component can be up, uh, upgraded independently. You have simple and decoupled code bases that makes the, 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 the people that are working in our team really efficient because you have less context to deal. Each micro front end can be run as a standalone. So again, every team can run just the pieces that he's working instead of having a 10 years huge application to deal. You can have independent deployment to release and everything together can empower your team to be more autonomous. This is really important for us because our group has multiple uh, business units that are involved at Red Hat. And now also IBM is collaborating on this infrastructure and reuse this infrastructure in some of their projects. On the next slide is a sneak peek of how we build uh, this architecture. So we take them the monolith that we have. And instead of building everything together, we break down in a, a lot of smaller components. In blue, you can see a container app that a container app uh, covers everything in the application and tie everything together. And every component, an editor is a micro front end. The menu there is a navigator is another micro front end. And in the top is also a micro front end that's responsible for handling the menu, but do actions like save, download, and do the deployment. And on the next slide, you can take a look about how this fits with microservices architecture. Because on the left, you have the old style of applications. That is good, depending on the context, where you have a front end, a back end, talking the data store. We call this a monolith. In the middle is what we, call, we know as a microservice architecture, where you have a front end that talks as an API with multiple microservices and go through the data store. And in the right are the micro front end pattern that you take. The, your front end that was a monolith and breaking down in multiple components that talk with the API gator, that talk with um, a multiple microservice and talk with the data stores. And in the next slide, you can see that how this all ties together because you have one container that have multiple names for this. Could be container, could be app shell, but it's not the container for Docker. It's the container for the web application. So we have a, a container that is responsible to load to fetch all the micro front ends and decide where to display in the screen. And so at where to show which micro front end. And after that, each micro front end runs in isolation, talking with his own backend. That is BFF stands for backend for front end, is a pattern for backends for micro front end that talk with the data store. It's important as in microservice architecture to don't mix, don't talk at, at, at each microservice with the other. And one important thing about micro front end is that two types of integration. The first one is the, uh, how, the integration, how the uh, container integrates with multiple microservices. The first one is the runtime integration, is the client side integration, is that the container, when it's loading in the, in the, in the browser page, will fetch external resource and then take uh, and, and, and then load and handle the micro front end. So the micro front end lives outside the main deployment of your application. There is a big pro for this architecture, this style this, of integration, that every, every micro front end can be deployed independently. But it's also, there is a lot of cons that the tooling in the setup is much more complicated because you have, instead of one deployment for your front end, 
you have multiple deployments that need to handle scale. You need to have more uh, accomplice deployment and tooling for, for, for your application. And your test suite become much more harder to do an integration test because you need to test multiple. And on the next slide, is it's a second type of integration. There is the build time integration. Build time integration is that every micro front end is built and developed in isolation, but before uh, uh, going for, 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 for production, there is a build step that takes the source of all the micro front ends built together in a single uh, unit. It's easy because it's easy to set up and, and understood, but the, the cons for this is that container needs to be deployed every time that a uh, 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 change is done. So in the next slide, there is we, we use build time integration because for us, it's easy to do uh, integration tests and also it's easy to handle the deployment and to be, be, be sure that all the application scales consistently. In our case, you select the build time integration and why we, and what are the advantages? The biggest advantage in the next slide that we takes about in general, about when, when so you ask me about in five minutes introduction for micro front ends, what is the biggest benefit is our autonomous team. In my group that are multiple teams between six and seven and even one team now at IBM, they are working in isolation, are working together. They have a smaller kick and build. They focus just on the problem. There is no noise of a big monolith. And then we, in the runtime, we pack everything together. So the teams can be more autonomous on the front end with the, this architecture. There is still the cons that there is bugs that can appear just when you do the last deploy because the team work independently. But in our side, this is being a huge beneficial. So in the next slide is when you talk or doing decision about, uh, 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 sorry, uh, about just to work up, about what you do if you run time integration or to, to, to build time integration is how far you're going to go with the independence. If you're going to go smaller, you go with the build time. If you go to hardcore, you go to client side. And now, Caponeto, you go and talk about how to go in deeper with multiple architecture and how you apply micro front ends in, in our technology. Yeah, so to, to follow uh, Ender's presentation, uh, I will talk more about our uh, use cases now. Uh, Ender gave us uh, a nice introduction about everything, but now I'm going deeper on the architectural decisions that we needed to make to, uh, to uh, adapt to these new challenges and uh, pursue these goals of, of moving from the monolith to uh, micro front ends. So as Heather mentioned, our editors were living on this huge uh, monolith application and we wanted to extract only the editors from from this and distribute across multiple multiple mediums like uh, a web application or a vs code uh, extension or even github.dev which is pretty much a, a vs code environment and why not the github uh, web page uh, GitHub offers a way to, to edit your files, but we wanted to put our editors there too, to, to provide a richer uh, experience for our users. And this way, uh, it, it is not limited to it because uh, we could have uh, our editors on desktop applications or even IntelliJ and things like that. But our goal was to put our editors inside all these mediums or channels that we call them and, and keep the editor code uh, the same, reusable, and distribu distribute uh, it across different uh, channels. So with all that in mind, we created the multiplying architecture. The multiplying architecture is basically a set of patterns and, and plumbing code and APIs that we've created to, to achieve this goal and to extract our editors from that monolith and distribute across multiple channels. So here is the, the core abstractions for the multiplying architecture. 
uh, we basically have three core components. The first one is the channel. The channel is, as I said, everything that's outside the, the editor. So uh, it could be VS Code, it could be on web application, desktop application, and things like that. And this channel wants to uh, render the editor inside it. And we wanted to, to distribute these, ed these editors across these different channels. The second component is, the, is something that we call the envelope. The envelope is nothing more than a communication layer for the channel and the envelope, so, and the editor, sorry, and to, make, to make them work together, but in a decoupled manner. So uh, people working on the editor can focus on the editor, and people working on the channel can focus on the their channel in an independently way. And, and a third component is the view itself, because it's important to highlight here that we are not limited to, to editors. Of course, we created a, a set of, of code to, for, for our editors, because we work with it. But uh, this is not limited to editors. It could be any view any application that could be wrapped inside this envelope and distributed across different channels. And an additional uh, component that I just said is the editor itself, that is nothing more than an, a specialized type of a view. So now that we know the core components about the architecture, here is the an image showing uh, what uh, is each, each part of the architecture. So here I'm showing the online channel that we call, and uh, you can see uh, around the online channel, we have many tools to interact with the editor, but everything is done using uh, a common contract that uh, uh, the moving parts need to implement. And inside uh, the envelope, instance, we have the editor itself. And this, this case is even more complex because we, if you can, you can take a look here, uh, we have two editors, right? One for the text and one for the diagram. So we needed to wrap two uh, envelopes inside an additional envelope so that applications that need this envelope could, could reuse this entire envelope of the combined editors that we call, or uh, applications can use uh, each editors independently. And here is just a, a, a diagram showing uh, everything that I just said to, to have this visualization about uh, our outer envelope involving two more envelopes inside. Here is another example that uh, <clears throat> we distribute our editors inside the VS Code. Here you can see that we don't need the text editor here because uh, VS Code already has its built-in uh, Monaco editor, and and we could and we can leverage from this editor and. And for our case, we just need to put our diagram uh, envelope there, and the and our extension is ready to be used. And you can see here that the serverless workflow editor is the same for the online channel. For the uh, GitHub.dev is the same, or VS Code.dev, it's the same experience with just a small adjustment. Uh, we could uh, publish our extension there too. <clears throat> Here's another example of a Chrome extension that I was previously talking about. In this case, uh, uh, we needed the text editor uh, and the, the diagram editor. And in this case, we reuse the combined editor here. So 
this pretty much sums up uh, the architecture. Uh, I mean, it, it's a high level view, of course, but uh, and, and it's not that simple, but uh, in general, what you need to do to, to, to distribute your editor across different uh, channels is, is to implement an envelope API and a channel API. The envelope API is all, the, all sets, all set of, of functions that the channel can call from the editor. So for example, uh, each channel has uh, different ways of, of triggering the undo and redo operation in uh, editor, right? So uh, once it happened on a channel, they can just call it from the envelope API and the editor will react to that in, the, in its own way. On the other hand, uh, we have the channel API and the channel API are a set of functions that the envelope can call from the channel, but the editor doesn't care uh, where it lives. Uh, it doesn't care if it's online application or it's on VS Code, but through the envelope, they can call these methods and the channel, AP, the channel API in each channel will react in its own way. So for example, if I have a button inside my editor that opens a file in a particular path, I can call this, this open file uh, function in, in my uh, channel API. And each channel will react it on its own way. So for example, VS Code could open a new tab with this file, whereas the, the online channel could open a new tab of the browser and things like that. So this is uh, pretty much a general view of, of our architecture and how, and how we uh, grouped our things. And now I would like to show you more uh, examples of editors that we have built. First one is the Dash Builder editor. Dash Builder is a nice uh, editor for you to create uh, richer visual visualizations and dashboards uh, using YAML, and you can fetch data from other uh, external sources and things like that. But the point is that the Dash Builder editor is uh, something that we distribute uh, on VS Code and in online uh, channels. And you can start using uh, the Dash Builder editor on this URL. Another example is the BPMN editor. Uh, this is the business process editor that uh, you can, uh, we offer the same experience. This is VS Code and this is the key sandbox, the online channel for the uh, BPMN editor. And you can see here that the editor is the same, but they are uh, living in uh, different environments. Same thing for the DMN editor. The DMN is for decisions. And here's the VS code. And here is the key sandbox, the online channel. And again, the PMML editor for scorecards. Uh, here is the VS code. And here is the online channel. Another great example of editors, this is uh, a great example of, of cross-team collaboration because uh, we collaborated with the Kaoto team to, for them to create their uh, VS Code extension. They already have their online version of their editors. And with our collaboration, we uh, were able to, to publish their uh, uh, VS Code extension for, for their tooling. And last, uh, last example, this is, uh, this is uh, an example of using the, the combined editor here, but in a different way, because this editor, you can see here, uh, you, the, the text editor is collapsed, but I can show it. But this editor is in read-only mode, and also we can uh, color the notes because 
in this case, uh, this is not for authoring. This is in runtime. So when the, the serverless workflow is run, uh, we can uh, interact with the envelope and, and color the nodes that the, the workflow passed uh, through. And this is uh, and this is an online channel, but it lives in a Quarkus extension, which is pretty nice. So if you want to know more about our code, we have uh, a bunch of packages to, to make this all uh, real. And this is our repository. This is a monorepo that we put everything there. So if you're interested in, in learning more, you can uh, reach us out there. Also, the URLs for you to, to try the serverless workflow and Dash Builder editors and the DMN, BPMN, and PML editors on this URL too. So to finish the presentation, I would like to show you some authoring highlights that uh, we implemented around the editor, but uh, here it's important to say that uh, the editor lives in the channels, but they don't know what's happening around the, the around them in the channel. So with that, we could we could create uh, many cool things, many cool features. So the first one is the multi-file support in the browser. Uh, here you can see that I can uh, I we store all the files in the user's browser, and you can move from one file to another, and you can see the editors loading on the on the channel. The, in this case, it's the online channel. Next one is the autocomplete. Because we use the Monaco editor, we can uh, leverage from autocompletion. So autocomplete uh, uh, properties or structures or entire code snippets. And uh, this is pretty nice because uh, we this is very useful for users that are trying this the first time or need some help to create some code structure and things like that. And despite I'm showing this in the online channel, on VS Code, it works too, and Chrome extension. And, and this, is, uh, this is working across all different channels. Another example is the validation. Since we deal with uh, text, text files, we can uh, validate the files if there if there is some problem, and and if there is, each channel can react on its own way. So, for example, here in the online channel, uh, we show the the validation problems on on this panel, but on the VS Code, we use the built-in uh, problems tab that VS Code has. Another nice feature that we built around the editors is the GitHub integration. So here I opened a sample. The sample just have one file, and I will create a, a new repository on GitHub. And another nice thing about this that we implemented is the Quarkus Accelerator. If the user chooses to use the Quarkus Accelerator, we will create a Quarkus project already set up for serverless workflow, and we will place the, the, the serverless workflow file that the user is uh, modifying into the source main resources folder and combine everything and, and throw it in the uh, GitHub repository. Let me just speed up a little bit this video. So here we created a repository. You can see here uh, Quarkus, uh, Quarkus files like Docker files uh, and things like that. And, and I'm going to show that you, people can work on one channel. And, and since we have this source of truth, which is the GitHub, we can commit 
on the GitHub page and pull the changes back to the to the the online tool and do the same all the way around. So I'm, now I'm editing on the on our online channel and push the things back to GitHub. There we go. Another integration that we did was with VS Code. Once we have a, a repository, we can import this repository into our online tools. And with that, we can, uh, let me just speed up a little bit. Oh, sorry. I clicked outside. Okay. So importing my repository here. And once you import your repository, you'll be able to access the this repository using uh, VS Code.dev or VS Code Desktop. You can see here all the files are here, and we offer the same editor experience. And now I'm gonna do the same experience that I did in the last video, which is updating something, push uh, to the repository, and 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 pull this change back into the online channel. I'm pulling the changes. There we go. So this is interesting because each user can work on their preferred uh, preferred tool, right? Uh, users can work on VS Code.dev or the desktop uh, VS Code or even the online channel or Chrome extension, extension or even other channels that uh, the editor can be provided. Another thing that uh, we did is the integration with uh, a samples repository to help users to, to explore our editor, editors. So these samples live in a different repository, which is cool because people can uh, submit their own examples. And these examples will be uh, av available for everyone to try. So here you can see I'm, I'm opening many Dash Builder examples and serverless workflow examples. Another cool thing that we did is the integration with OpenShift. We built uh, a set of, 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 of code to interact with OpenShift from the front end. So once you connect to, the, to your OpenShift instance, you can uh, quickly deploy your serverless workflow. And in, in this video, I already had one deployment ready and just showed how easy it was to, to deploy just a, a click of a, of a button. And uh, this deployment, it's the same that it, it has a Quarkus application uh, inside it. And we just put the workflow inside it and users can uh, use this deployment and share with others. And the cool thing on this example is that I'm using the developer sandbox for, for OpenShift, which is free. So uh, R2 is free and the developer sandbox is free. And so uh, the user does, doesn't need to expand anything to try these cool features. Another thing that uh, we implemented, this is the DMN editor. And this is a simple decision that uh, based on inputs, uh, based on inputs, uh, the decision shows if the driver driver's license should be suspended or not. But in this case, uh, we have local backend uh, services running uh, on user's machine, and this enables to the user uh, quickly a quick feedback on their altering. So you can see here on the on the user interface that that the diagram is being validated. The editor doesn't know about it, but 
it is connected to a uh, local and um, optional backend services. Another feature that we are experimenting is dev mode. We created uh, a dev mode uh, uh, image for uh, users. And this dev mode image is basically a Quarkus application already uh, set up with all the dependencies and extensions and, and running on dev mode. So once the user connects to the OpenShift, to their OpenShift instance uh, in, and chooses to use the dev mode, a new deployment running in dev mode will be created for them. And this enables them to quickly try the serverless workflow. Let me speed up this video. So here I'm showing that I'm opening a serverless workflow and uploading my serverless workflow to the dev mode deployment, which is pretty fast because it's Quarkus. And I can run my, my workflow and see the result. All the nodes are painted. And I can also quickly test my changes. I, I did an edit here on the message and again, upload it to dev mode. And I will run it again and see the edit there. And this is not limited to one file. I can move around files. And for, and for example, here, I went to another sample and uploaded it again to dev mode, access it and trigger a cloud event to run my workflow. And last, um, this is my last example, uh, is the envelope communication. This is uh, for the editors itself, but here I show that through the envelope, we can communicate between envelopes, right? Because here uh, I show that I'm clicking on the nodes and the text editors, the text editor react to that and moves the, the cursor uh, to that node. And the other way around works too. If I click on the on the with the cursor, I can move uh, the the diagram editor can react to that through the envelope and uh, highlight the node in the in the particular place. So yeah, that's, all that I, that I, oh, go ahead. that's all that I wanted to, to show. And uh, I'm going to pass uh, you back, Heather. Mm, thank you so much. And uh, the most important thing is that uh, in my, in my point of view, I'm working with, with a front-end developer for more than 15 years, is that good front-end development is super hard. And the adoption that we decided like two or three years ago to go full speed of micro front-ends, breaking down our application is smaller pieces to make the teams go independently and to develop really fast and with a small scope and with a clear interface prove that is a, is a, is a great uh, architect that should invest because all the benefits that the backend people talking uh, talks about building micro front end, uh, uh, sorry, microservices and reuse those microservices in, in different ways prove for us in the, in the uh, that is benefit to adopt micro front end architecture. Besides that, uh, the, the decision to adopt my, um, um, micro front ends allow as component to show with our team to build a big ecosystem uh, beyond it to make the front end with multiply architecture to talk as the Microsoft, Microsoft front end is it lives independently as you see from the editor for instance Caponeto's team I, I was able to take the same editor micro front end editor and put to work in the Visual Studio code and the editor team don't even does need to change one line of code so it's a huge benefit and if you are invested in, in front-end technology, I advise you to go and take a look on those. And in my final words is that if you are doing a monolith uh, web application, remember that in the last 15 years, I see a lot of shiny web frameworks comes become the best thing and gone. 
So think a little about what will be the impact on your web application if your favorite framework is not the most a shiny tech right now. And then figure out what will be the impact of your team decided to willing to go to another application. Micro front end is one technique and one architectural part that, that can help you to avoid uh, the big hit right. So this is what we have for, for today. And I hope this time is, is really helpful for you because if, if with micro front end, you can choose between have total independence with the teams go alone with a test combination or side combination like we do with, um, with, with, with the, um, our beauty tools. And thank you so much for your time. And we are here for any questions or, or on, on the internet to reply. Thank you both for the presentation. And just a reminder, everyone, please put any questions in the comments chat and we will give you a couple moments to do so. Thank you, Jeff and Luis and Wolfen for, for coming. All right, well with that, thank you all for joining us today and we hope you all enjoyed this session. As a reminder, this session and others will be made available soon on our Red Hat Developer YouTube channel. Thanks all.